So we are live. Welcome everybody to this, which is our third free webinar of the 2019 Smart Building Series. And uh, today we are talking about embracing an open source philosophy for better UX in buildings. And I'm really happy to be joined today by Jonathan McFarlane, who is co-founder of ACA Projects and ACA Engine. How are you doing, Jonathan? Well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Yeah, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. And I know it's sort of a bit of a change of time today because you're based in Australia. Um, but no problem if everybody who's listening out there or um, we, we are recording this. So if you did want to share it with colleagues, um, please feel free. Um, I'll give you all the details of that in a minute. First of all, I just want to say a big thank you to um, our sponsor for the webinar today, which is Haystack Connect. So if you guys don't know about Project Haystack, I suggest you go to project-haystack.org. Um, they're doing some excellent work about tagging uh, metadata um, specifically for building automation data, but also more broadly with the IoT. And they're holding their big conference this uh, this spring this, uh, in May uh, 13th to 15th in San Diego, California. Um, definitely, if you're interested in IoT data, I strongly recommend you uh, you go and join him um, with that conference. And you can uh, find out all about it at haystackconnect.org. So, um, as I said, um, this is being recorded. Um, we will be sharing um, both like Jonathan's uh, presentation and you know his and the Q and A afterwards. Uh, so please, um, please, you can go and find that. I'll be on SoundCloud, on YouTube, it'll be on our um, iTunes channel as well. So uh, yeah, feel free to share it once it's finished. Uh, and finally, obviously, we want to make this interactive. So if you guys do have questions, please type them in. Um, I will get them here and then we'll be able to discuss those questions after Jonathan has finished his uh, presentation. So without further ado, Jonathan, do you want to take over? Yeah, thanks for the intro, James. So uh, let me just get my slide progressing. So the, the topic is all about open source and how that impacts UX, user experience in your building. So this might not be an obvious connection and I'm certainly not, uh, the purpose of this talk is not to convince you to only select open source technology, but there is a lot of open source technology uh, as part of the building technology stack today and that will increase. So we're going to start with a bit of an overview on open source. But the main point of this talk is to uh, to see what we can learn about those methods within open source and the, the, the thinking and uh, how we apply open thinking to user experience design in uh, what is essentially smart buildings. So I'll start with who am I, what do I do, how do I know about this stuff? Uh, so my educational background is uh, within uh, the Faculty of Architecture and that's a discipline of design science. So it's this interesting area where uh, I was sort of challenging the interface and the built environment and this has sort of come full circle in, uh, back to what I do every day at, at ACA. Um, but in between that I was, I was an IT and AV uh, solution designer. So I, I bring that up because a lot of my job back then was uh, was connecting interesting devices to a network and making sure they worked together before we had the language of uh, IoT. And uh, I, I was working in medical faculties, medical simulation labs, and certainly just uh, learning uh, by being thrown into the deep end on, on how to get all these network-based technologies interacting as a solution. Um, that was sort of why uh, I co-founded ACA Engine with my mate Steve, uh, and he certainly, uh, came at it from open source from day one. Uh, he's my technical co-founder that uh, immediately wrote everything in open source. And uh, because of that, you can you can literally look back to our first line of code uh, on any of our open source projects uh, back for our day one, back in 2010, when we started our open source uh, project ACA engine. So this has led for us doing extremely large deployments. Um, we're a white label solution, so you might not know our branding, but you'd probably know some of our customers. Uh, we might talk about that a little bit at the end when I do a bit of a demo. I'm, I don't want to be salesy here. I want to talk about uh, the philosophies behind all of this, but I will use ACA Engine as an example because it is completely open source. Uh, so 
moving on, and by the way, that's that's me on the left and the, my dog on the right, just so you know which is which. The the outline for today, um, starting with open source uh, technology. Basically, this is the educational bit. I'll, I'll go through the the roles, the license models, and uh, the workflows, and and everything within that. We're going to start looking at the building, the smart building. And how do we learn how to be more open with our designs? How do we borrow ideas from open source, even if it's not an open source technology? And we're going to go through uh, how for every closed system, there's an open alternative uh, for uh, middleware versus platform and how to avoid middleware. And many uh, things that are middleware actually sometimes call themselves platform. And it's not really true if you start designing and looking at their design. And then all of this ultimately leads to UX. So if we have an open uh, building based on, on the selection of open dependencies, open design, that's influenced by part and by open source, or might even include some open source, the user experience possibilities uh, can go into directions we're not even thinking of right now. And this is going to rapidly change in, in the, the UX of the building as these uh, legacy systems uh, that are closed off uh, start uh, disappearing and more open technology enters the building. I steal a lot of ideas from the people I work with and the, uh, that certainly the, the next few slides in this presentation I've stolen from a member of our team, Kim Burgess. He uh, did an open source talk at ISC earlier this year. Uh, that's him explaining that open source doesn't necessarily mean free. Uh, and I'll touch on that a little bit more as well. And uh, we're going to dive straight into what is open source and, and the community. And open source is basically uh, a, a license model, a dist, a dist uh, model and a, a community of users, contributors and maintainers. All of us are, are users of open source if we realize it or not. Most, uh, most technolo technology platforms, technology products we use are using some element of open source technology. It may be the database, it may be the operating system. Obviously, fam fam famously, uh, Red Hat, which is an open source provider, was acquired by IBM for tens of billions of dollars recently, proving you can certainly have business models around open source. And then the contributors, uh, who you would expect, the programmers, but there's also other elements. You can open source any element of the project. You might have open source uh, interface elements. Uh, and then there's the, a big part of, of open source contributors, uh, document writers and designers. And then ma maintainers will go through as we go through the workflow. So to talk about open source workflow, we have to talk about Git. And, and this is a method uh, that allows you to take a snapshot of any moment of time within that, uh, that the life cycle of that code. Uh, and have a master, and you can revert back to any three of these uh, in this in this branch. So this is the most simple version of Git, where we have our three commits and then a master branch. That application can be downloaded from here. You can revert back and download from there and branch off if you want to. So that leads to the the next sort of flow of taking a common base and then having a a parallel branch with its own development commitments and. This is one of the, the major benefits of open source is that you can take uh, a common base and start developing new features without affecting that common base. So you might be more experimental in this branch, which leads to a new feature, and you won't merge it back to the master branch until it's gone through its own quality assurance. And that's where maintainers come in. They, they are often the ones that uh, can allow that merge to come back into the master branch. So this slide here is one of the most uh, common workflows in, in open source uh, life cycle. So you have a common base, you branch it off, something is rapidly developed, new features are developed, and then we merge it and we can revert back at any point in time. So th this, this uh, process really suits teams and working with lots of developers and lots of teams. And if you open up your technology to open source, you then have uh, new things coming in from, from all over the place. And, and certainly some of the elements that we have completely open source and licenses that anyone can use freely, including for commercial use, uh, we have uh, uh, a much more complicated diagram than this, but it all, it all comes back to this common workflow of, of master branch, forking that off into a new branch and then merging it back uh, if and when the maintainer decides to bring that back in. 
So there's tools that exist that take that, that Git method and allow you to build discussions, notifications, and project management tools around it. So GitHub is one of the most famous, but there's many. Uh, so again, this is another example of a company that has a commercial model around something that's open source. Git itself is open source, and they have GitHub, which is a company uh, that was acquired by Microsoft. So there's a lot of uh, commercial elements within open source. And that, that, that's the, the easy contradiction of people that think open source means free. Um, this is my favorite part about working on open source projects. As someone that has a system design background, uh, you know, I used to design IT systems, audio visual systems, the level of documentation that you get within a, a open source project is everything you, you're looking for as a system designer. The best thing is with most of open source projects, you don't have to go through a sales process or a, a, a business NDA process to get access to this. So I've got four different examples of that, starting with open source is somewhat automatically documented. Now, don't be put off, I'm, I'm gonna load some code here and we're looking at one of our uh, device drivers. In, in our land, uh, a device driver is the method for us as a platform to communicate with a device uh, such as a sensor or a, uh, a door lock or a TV or whatever it may be. In this case, I'm literally looking at the, the code that, uh, that does user location tracking uh, for a particular integration. And what I mean by open source is somewhat documented. On this open source license we're using, we, uh, we allow the source code, um, and it's part of the license, to have the source code available for anyone that has the license to this, uh, to this open source element. So our, our modules are completely open source, in, in, and I'll talk about licensing in a moment to explain the difference between each different license model. But you can use this freely. So good programmers, and, and this is my uh, technical co-founder, so I know he's a good programmer. Good programmers document as they go. So even if you're not a developer, you can use things like this to get a really deep understanding on, on how everything fits together and, and works together. So an example here is uh, I'm looking at a comment that basically just says, uh, uh, how do we deal with repeat lookups so we don't count people twice, for example. So if I'm designing a system and I have that question in mind, do we, can we meet that requirement? You can read this as comments in the code. But just jumping back into my presentation, uh, you want to, you don't want to start there. Uh, you don't send someone uh, uh, just logic uh, and driver code without them knowing how it all comes together. So most open source projects have technical overview pages. It goes over the concepts, uh, how to structure modules, uh, and even just high level overviews on, on what the system is and what it does. And again, we're using some tooling here from GitHub. So GitHub have uh, their own sort of process on how to display this. And for an open source project, we start with that concept. Then we jump down one level deeper. So you know how the system works. You see all of the, uh, the structure and the concepts of how everything works together. I can look at the source code and if I'm technical enough, that can be usable and valuable to me. Perhaps it's not, maybe you don't need to go that far, but as a technical system designer, uh, you should at least go that far if it's something critical. And then you can, uh, as a developer, you get to the page where you, you wanna see what are the available functions in every API, what's the available responses, and this allows you to really build any integration uh, and use the system freely as you want. So test environments. Then the final thing here, so remember this is all just publicly available, no salesperson to talk to. It's, it's one of the benefits of open source is that you can, then go somewhere and, and actually download uh, an open source version, uh, a licensed version of most open source projects. So for our open source version, we tell you how you can download it, how to set it up on your laptop, and we give you some elevator music. So as it's downloading, you can uh, listen and, and uh, be entertained. So with all of that in mind, let's talk about licenses. And, and again, I'll use uh, how we have licensed things. Um, but there's, there's basically two, two main combinations and they, they each have uh, like subsectors, but I advise you to go to choosealicense.com. It's a good resource to start reading about this. Uh, I, I strongly recommend if you're, if you're watching this and, and thinking about open, uh, 
adopting open source that you you do get legal advice and and you read a lot more than what I'm going over today. But a completely open example is the general public license, the GPL. Uh, this allows you to use whatever is on that license uh, in any way, including commercially. So for elements where uh, that we have open source, for example. Uh, it's really core fundamental things that we build on top of. So it doesn't really have much to do with our application, but it might be a framework that it would be very beneficial if more than our developers were using it. Uh, we want multiple companies use, using it. We want uh, the biggest companies in the world contributing to it. Uh, and we have examples of that. We have uh, open source libraries that are, uh, are frameworks for the, for the web, uh, a project called Spider Gazelle. Um, these things always have interesting names. Uh, and if at the end of this presentation, I'll give you a, a link to our GitHub so you can see all of our projects. Uh, and we allow people to use that freely. Um, but then anything that we want people to have access to, including all of that documentation I went through uh, and can do their own testing, their own deployments, we have a license called Creative Commons. And, and that's, uh, that's used in, in more than just open source community. This is used in just licensing in general. And this allows you to use it in any way except commercial use. So it allows you to get your hands dirty, but if you want to apply this to a building, you have to buy an enterprise license. And remember, licenses are simply just agreements between a buyer and a, and a seller or a, a user and a provider. So enterprise arrangements you come up with with your legal team, uh, but then you can also, uh, because technology is not one thing, it's a stack of technology, you, com you combine this with uh, with CC and with uh, GPL. So that's a really high level overview of licensing, but you can really dive deep into that. It's not the most interesting area, but it's certainly uh, something you need to consider. Um, and as uh, smart buildings become more uh, uh, modern and, and there's companies that are now working in this space that are historically haven't been in, in the building industry, they're bringing along this, uh, this just usage of open source because that's what the the general IT and development community has been doing for, for a long time. Um, so you're going to see a lot more of that. So it's, it's worth learning about. Okay, I, I went through that very quickly because I'm more interested in, in user experience. And so from here, I'm going to talk about how everything should be open as a building UX philosophy. That, that's an awkward sentence. I mean, building is a noun there, not as a verb. Uh, but we're taking this open uh, UX philosophy and I'm not saying you need to have an open source uh, technology or platform or, or, uh, or building access control. It doesn't need to be open source, but it certainly needs to be open to some level when it comes to integration. So this slide, I couldn't get away with uh, anything but bullet points. And this is basically the selection criteria uh, to allow you to have a completely open building and we'll talk about how that impacts the user experience so number one we're looking for something with documented apis uh, documented apis to the level of of that documentation i whipped through uh, ideally but at least in a, in a way that you can freely access and read how the functions work so at least from a design point of view you know if it can be selected and you know if it can uh, meet desired user experience goals the second point is many things tick that box, but then you start investigating and you realize it's using middleware or unnecessary uh, cloud subscriptions. So if there's a single purpose, like if we want to connect to a desk sensor, we don't want to have to go out to a cloud server and pay for cloud subscriptions just for that one element. Um, maybe there's other elements we're happy to do that with, but this is just an extra complexity. And, and we'll talk about a few examples of that and, and how platforms are different from middleware. And then the, the third point is we don't want vendor lock-ins or ecosystem lock-ins. And, and that's really uh, writing that point in mind with hardware companies that, that have software, but purely as a marketing uh, element to get you to buy more hardware. So they, they have a catalog of hardware products and the way they sell it is by uh, having a software layer. And the only way to integrate with their hardware is with more of their hardware or more of their, uh, their closed boxed software. Uh, so that's one of the main ones to avoid. Then the final point here is maybe we, we find something as a selection process for designing a smart building that ticks three of those boxes, but then there's some bullshit process uh, to get access to that API. And, and that's, a, that's an issue, and I obviously put this on there from experience, but 
that's an issue because it becomes a bottleneck. If, if you have 200 devices that you're integrating with in, in a building project, and one of them requires an NDA to get access, uh, that's the vendor asking for that, in, and uh, it just becomes a, a process that gets in the way, slows things down, and adds unnecessary risk, and we can probably find something as an alternative. So that's what we'll do. Um, so th this next sort of statement is, is, is my own quote. This is my own thinking. I just wanted to put it down on, on paper because people that don't and companies that don't uh, have that element, it's, it's not asking for much. It's asking for integration into their products. And from my experience, a company that does not have open integration is either hiding bad tech or cannot get their head around software business models. So the bad tech element, we see that all the time as a company that integrates with uh, third party devices. The companies that don't let us integrate or, or uh, take a long time to give us the API documentation, they're, they're hiding some something that uh, they don't want people to know. And that's usually things like keeping passwords as clear text that anyone can access once it's on the network or uh, just inefficiencies that you wouldn't expect in, in modern technology. Uh, but then the, the, the latter, uh, th that's an easy problem for them to solve. They just need to update their, their methods and their, and their tech. The latter is more of a thinking of these businesses that uh, they're, they're just burying their head in the sand and, and hoping to run the same business models without adapting to, uh, to software. Um, and typically that's the hardware companies. So let's look at for every closed system, there's an open alternative. So what I mean by closed and open, uh, open meets those four, those four bullet points, documented APIs. We can talk to it directly. We don't have to go through middleware. Uh, we don't have to sign NDAs to get access to its protocols because they should be pretty stock standard. Um, versus something that's not. And here we have two examples, slightly different technologies in their methods, but the outcome is the same. They, they count people. And there's many reasons to count people in a building. And uh, typically, uh, we, it, for a meeting room scenario, for example, for checking people into meeting rooms, for just uh, general analytics of the building. So the, the option on the left gives us direct access via protocols that we're, that the building's already using and networks that we can tie into that the building's already using, such as KNX and BACnet. Um, where the one on the right, you start looking at it and the technology looks good, the APIs look great, but then there's uh, you find out the only way to integrate is through a vendor hosted cloud. And the problem with that, this is apparent. So I'm gonna talk about avoiding middleware when you can. And this, I'm still picking on that same vendor. This is their own marketing. And they're literally drawn middleware for their integration um, option. So uh, the reason middleware here doesn't work is because this is one simple requirement out of such a, a broad scope. If, if we're looking at the building holistically and we want this to be scalable and secure, uh, we, we have to start looking at areas we can remove inefficiencies. And if we have to talk to a cloud hosted uh, middleware uh, management system to talk to a single use device, uh, then it's, it's not gonna be efficient. So the next slide I'm gonna go to is uh, that I tried to come up with the best smart building design I could think of. I, uh, I spent a long time trying to think about how do I put this down on paper and, and basically, what we want is uh, a platform, uh, a central point, and th and connect to the thing individually. So if in the ideal world, every single dependency talks directly with standard protocols back to a central point. So that's every single lock on the door, every single camera, every single TV on the wall, every uh, every payment system, every everything that the building has in terms of technology back to a single point. That's that's hard to achieve, I, I get that. That's what we're all moving towards, but it's not completely realistic. This is okay. If there's middleware, it should be for a good reason. It's because the uh, it's a building wide thing perhaps, so that if it's a centralized building access control, uh, for a whole precinct and all three towers use the same building access control for every single door and boom gate, then talking to middleware might be okay. Uh, and then we can talk to things directly when we can. So the, the, the thing to avoid completely is talking to middleware that talks to a thing or a single purpose 
collection of things. So that's the desk sensors, the people counters, as the examples that I'm picking on because uh, they're becoming quite uh, widespread in, in, in this industry. And, and it also comes down to a thing that you don't have to keep throwing sensors everywhere. There's other ways to uh, achieve the same user experience. So avoiding middleware is not just uh, going through my checkpoints and finding an alternative product that ticks all those boxes in terms of API and, and no middleware. It could be remove the technology altogether and use something that's already in the building that is already on the network. And we'll talk about that uh, and, and, and I'll illustrate that in, in a demo that I'll do at the end as well. So this is the main thing to avoid. And, and my crude drawing here that I did in a notepad not that long ago, uh, looks very similar to the, the marketing from this, this system that is asking you to subscribe to their cloud to connect to some people counting. Um, avoid this when you can. This sort of leads to user experience is not user interface. UX is not UI. And with all of the open thinking that we've sort of gone through, um, be it very rapidly, I know, um, but thinking about all, the, all that integration possibility when we have access to uh, things that are open source, all the documentation, the, the ease of use, we can run our own experiments, not affect anything, uh, and then apply that thinking to things in the building that need to be integrated with, their integration methods should be as open as possible. They don't need to be open source, but they should be open. Uh, if we have that, user experience can go in a completely new direction. We don't have to be stuck to UI. Uh, and you know, I love that image in the background because that's, that's an example of user interface. Uh, that user experience is extremely intimidating. And we need to start thinking about what is the best user experience. So apply open thinking to everything, link everything, have systems interact with each other, and that can lead to better journeys. So get away from walking to one interface, interacting with some you know, technology, uh, interface technology, glass and touch panels. A lot of these touch panels exist because, again, it's, it's a, uh, a closed system that is easy to sell uh, and also easy to buy because it doesn't require much thinking. It's, it's sort of lazy. And that's, you know, why do every room have, why does it have a room booking panel? Is, is another touch panel the best experience in this space? No, it's not. It, it should be more automatic, more seamless. So I've just got an example here where we're going to go through a, a, a building journey. And you've got to start thinking about the pre-building experience. Where does it start? Uh, it might be as simple as uh, I receive a meeting request from an organization that it occupies a building. Uh, there's an opportunity right there to start having some pre-building experiences. As part of that meeting request, you could add extra data to uh, allow users to pre-register, to pre-check in, to order their catering, to reserve a car spot, uh, or to get directions. And that leads to what are, what are the entry points in a, in a building and how do we be part of that experience? Sometimes that leads to city integration. Um, certainly in, in, in Asia and in Hong Kong, where I spend a lot of my time in this part of the world, um, the governments, the organisations, the builders are definitely thinking about that. Then car space tracking is another entry point and how do we lead uh, to additional uh, uh, technologies? But how do we have all of this seamlessly work together? Concierge services, I think, is, is one of the most important things to, to automate with workflow automation. So not just another touch panel that automates the process. You don't want to have to go into a lobby and touch another interface that signs you into a building. Uh, we have the opportunity here to allow concierge staff to not be transactional. Don't just sit behind a desk and check people in. Uh, remove that, automate that, and allow them to provide customer service in the same way that removing the cash register in a retail store allows uh, retail staffers to go out and provide better customer service. Um, borrow ideas, ideas from these other verticals that uh, have been embracing this sort of technology for a lot longer than uh, the general smart building and smart workplace areas. Then wayfinding. I've already said many times user experience isn't user interface, but it can be. I'm not saying remove it completely. I'm saying pick and choose where it is based on the, the user uh, goals, user requirements, and the user journey mapping. And one interface that works well is a map. So maps have a, a, a good way to 
uh, to show you where things are, overlaid data on room uh, booking and desk availability, and that in, in turn might remove the need to have room booking panels and, and desk lights or any of these other bits of hardware that may not be necessary. Then that goes to desks and de desk finding, desk uh, tracking availability and, and, uh, and reports on that. The, the meeting room technology. So if, if that guy on the, on the, uh, on the tube in, in London uh, gets to this meeting room and we've already sent him a meeting invite and he's had the opportunity to pre-register, he should be able to go straight up to that room, uh, not worry about access. Uh, it's all integrated. It's, it's all a seamless journey. And when he gets there, his meeting should be up and running and his host is there because he's been communicating with his host the whole way through Slack or something similar. Uh, if that's indeed why he's even in the building, to have a meeting, which uh, these traditional meetings, and, and I could do a whole talk on that and how that's changing based on collaboration platforms, replacing the need for physical rooms in, in many cases. Uh, what I think is a, an important area now is, is comfort. Uh, I could say that as um, workplace wellness. So how does the, the air quality, the lighting levels, the, the, the different types of spaces available to match to your activity, to be more productive, how can we automate workflow and make people feel happy being there? Uh, and then finally, in this journey, is personalization. In a, in a workspace where it can be intimidating because you don't know where you're sitting, how do we have some level of, of ownership, some personalization? It, it can start as simple as a, as, a, as a locker that is not just controllable and bookable and self-assigned based on other experiences where we can automate that workflow, but tie into other uh, interesting things like have a, a locker essentially as a drop off and pick up point for services that are part of the, the general precinct. So the typical example there is uh, laundry drop off and pick up, uh, drop your shirts off, they get washed uh, and they are delivered and you can interact and, and see notifications and, and pay for all of this uh, seamlessly. It just, all just happens in the background. Um, or in, in Sydney, uh, what a lot of people like to talk about is the cold lockers, so you can get the beers dropped off on a Friday uh, and you know that uh, you have beers in, in your cold locker storage uh, and you can host your colleagues on, in your area of the building. Some personalization. And, and that personalization really applies to all of these areas because we're, we're looking for three key design decisions with all of this. So let me just go back to why I started with open source before I explain these three areas. With, with this open thinking, we can sort of assume or presume that everything is connected. Everything is now has the capability of uh, interacting with each element. So now as a, des as a designer, all I need to know is who are my users? What type of users are they? So let's map all the users of the building. If you're a single workplace, that's, you know, let's look at our active directory groups and, and what type of users we have. Uh, what type of visitors do we have? Do we tie into Salesforce or something to give us that data? And then we want to have some desired experience uh, that's re relative um, to the space. So map out all your spaces, map out all your users, and experience happens when this type of user goes into this type of space. That will generate a really long list that we usually call the user experience narrative. And then you start using those validation points I, I went through, those four points to say, well, for this type of experience to happen, we need these dependencies and they need to be open to allow this to happen in the first place. And then think about the whole journey as we've gone through. So uh, back to my, my, my crude platform design here. Uh, Let's put that into context. So we have a platform, we have a thing that that thing can be an authentication system that gives us who the user is. So we've identified the user through uh, Active Directory um, or through a domain um, service that logs all the users uh, and what device they've logged into. So that, that's one connection directly to that uh, enterprise system. Uh, the next thing can give us the space they're in. So that could be Cisco Meraki giving us uh, the uh, tying into their location services that tells us that this person who we know through Active Directory, and we know what device they've logged into, that device is now in this space. Uh, and then thirdly, the third thing can be the experience that needs to be triggered. That might be the air conditioning, the lighting, or perhaps in a meeting room, the audio visual system to be at this person's desired settings. So profile driven, control events to drive a desired experience that you've mapped out in this way because you've 
embraced open thinking uh, in, in your designs. So that was the really lightning fast overview of this. I tried to keep it to about half an hour so we can go in a demo and, and go through questions. Um, just my plugs, uh, I have a blog where I write about all of these topics in a lot more detail and, and other things. My company page is acaengine.com and our GitHub page, uh, easy to remember, you can just Google ACA projects or you can go to uh, github.com slash ACA projects. There's also a link to our GitHub at the very bottom of our homepage um, it, with the social icons. So I'm gonna um, start going through uh, uh, a user interface example that demonstrates a few user experiences. And uh, at the same time, I'm happy to answer questions as I, as I do so. Do we have any questions now before I do that or should I just jump straight in? <clears throat> yeah, I think if we jump, if we jump straight in and then um, we, can, we can do the questions after. Sure. So I'm looking at a, a user experience here uh, that's based around a map. And the reason I'm pulling this one up is because I want to talk about the dependencies we're tying into. So with that open thinking in mind, uh, this map is showing us available desks uh, on, a, on a floor plate on a, in a workspace. And there's a number of ways to get this data. And we typically start at what does the organization already have, or if it's a new building, what are they planning to have? And can that give us the required information for this desired user experience. So some people go into this the other way around saying, uh, we need some desk sensors because we need to know where everyone's sitting. Well, that, that's, that's leading with technology, not leading with a, a problem statement. So we do some investigation. We find out that they're using Cisco network switches and they have uh, laptop docks on every workstation because every workstation has a second monitor with a single USB connection. So, so there's incentive to dock your laptop. Every staff member here gets a laptop. So there's some things here feeding our dependency. It wouldn't work for everybody because it wouldn't work for an organization where uh, not everyone gets a laptop, not every desk has a second monitor as an incentive to dock. But what we do as a platform is then tie into uh, the, the network, uh, which is existing. This is just a, uh, a general Cisco network switch. The network switch tells us what port is active and then we have a database saying this port ID equals this desk number. And then our, uh, our platform can, can tell our user interface to highlight that desk ID as green or red. Really basic, but it ticks the exact user requirement without having to roll out a sensor per desk. So, that, so, so there are some, some gaps in, in that uh, user experience if, if there was additional requirements such as uh, roaming or, or what if you don't have a device or what if you don't dock your laptop? So that's where you just start stacking up additional things when you need them. You don't, you don't put them in place uh, until, you, until you investigate and realize you need them. And, and that's where you might then leverage the wireless network. And uh, with wireless network, you can also do location tracking, uh, but it's, it's not gonna give you the pinpoint detail of doing it per port at a desk. Typically wireless access points can give you location information down to uh, you know, let's say two or three meter radius. Um, and, and some of them can do much better than that, but there's a lot of IT dependencies there as well. Uh, in, in this scenario, it's, it's showing us a user's location and, and keep in mind, this is all dummy data. I'm not, uh, I'm not showing you where someone's sitting right now. Um, but it shows that uh, we can integrate directly into the wireless access point without having to go into, again, a, a sensor, a Bluetooth beacon, a, a camera system that no one wants to think about because of privacy concerns. Uh, and the organization in this case hasn't had to invest in any other hardware at this point to achieve these two things. And if you wanted to also do desk uh, availability, here I'm doing people searching, but if you wanted to do desk availability via the wireless access points, you can also do so, but be more general. You could highlight zones rather than individual desks. And you'd have red and green and orange uh, desk uh, zone colors. So you can say this, this area is, is probably uh, completely occupied because it's red, but here's orange, so there might be a couple of desks. Uh, and, and that's simply by the wireless access point, counting how many MAC addresses there are compared to how many uh, seats are available in that zone. Um, so there's some really simple stuff you can do there. But then if there is the need to uh, close the gaps, you, look, you then start investigating other, uh, other technologies, other dependencies. And that's where you go through my selection criteria of documented API, no middleware, uh, 
and you know no process to get that that and no uh, hardware based ecosystem. So that that's a starting point. Investigate what the building already has, then start closing the gaps and the dependencies based on the user uh, requirements, which follows that method I went through on this type of user, this type of space, what do you want to happen? This is a very general, um, very common people searching and desk availability, uh, but this can be applied to any area of the building. Um, so it, uh, uh, you can see here I've got some catering integration. I won't go through any more of this particular interface, um, but you can think that way about applying these profile-driven events and then just then backstep from there and, and work out what is the dependency that I need. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I wanted to show in, in, in this demo and um, I'll simply just open up to questions. Jonathan, thank you very much. That was uh, that was fantastic. And actually, you know, a lot to uh, to go through and unpack um, there and probably longer than we've got in this webinar. But um, so yeah, uh, please, uh, questions for Jonathan or myself, uh, type them in. And we can we can discuss them now. We've got uh, we've got plenty of time before the end of this webinar. Um, by the way, Jonathan, I think cold beer locker storage is about the most Australian thing I've I've ever heard. <laughs> yep, we've been experimenting with that one in in our office, and I think since day one of our business, uh, like most good Australian business stories, we started our business in a pub, and uh, one of the things we automated was a was a beer keg in our first office and that was the first module that we had <laughs> yeah definitely going to get some success with that the, and do you know the the what you just showed us with the the example there um is that is that something that you've open sourced that that user interface correct so um there's obviously elements of that user interface that are specific to that uh project like the map for example um uh, the map is just a scalable vector graphic, so it's something you can design in Adobe Illustrator. Uh, but that that framework, uh, and if you go to this GitHub link that you can see in front of you, there's there's an element there uh, that is all about our front end, and most of our front end uh, that we seem the common experiences that come up over and over again for user interface, we've open sourced and uh, makes it any easy for anyone to grab that, add their own branding, or, or indeed uh, uh, fork that off, have their own branch, and, and develop their own features on top. Okay. And uh, I'm right in thinking that you program in Ruby. Is that is that right? Yeah. So so our my co-founder, Stephen Von Takash, uh, he wrote uh, the back end in Ruby on Rails. That's correct. We're actually uh, uh, going through an internal project now where, where our next version will be uh, in Crystal. So if you want to look into that, we also have uh, uh, a link on our GitHub to uh, our ACA Projects Labs account where we're doing our experimental stuff. And uh, the next version, um, the next major upgrade for us will be a completely new framework that uh, that Stephen actually invented and open sourced. So okay. you can take our framework, which is a, a replacement for Ruby on Rails, uh, and use our framework for your own applications. Okay, great. Um, I mean, yeah, a lot of a lot of things that came to mind when um, when you were talking, and and I think actually, like a lot of it, I, you can kind of um, split it into two things really that we discussed, wasn't it? First, sort of like the overview of of sort of open source and what it is, and then a little bit more about your user experience, and I think both of which are like totally valid and totally things that the building industry need to need to embrace. One thing I thought were you saying about like the mindset, you know, that obviously this open source isn't just about the code, right? It's about, um, in a way, like open thinking, a different mindset. I mean, is, is there advice that you can give, let's say, to you know other other companies in the building industry about how they can foster that mindset? So they might be, you know, I mean, there are companies obviously that've been in business for decades who have a lot of legacy code. They're not used to this. Um, and you know they might be coming into that environment. How could they foster that? Or I think that my, my selfish answer to that is starting with the their integration methods. And you don't ha you can com you don't have to open source your full stack of technology. But if if you want to survive and and be selected by uh, companies that uh, are embracing open thinking, you need to have open integration methods. And if that doesn't exist, uh, 
you, you need to work they need to work with their engineering teams to make sure they have some method of open integration uh, if the if the vendors can get to that point uh, then there's no reason not to use their their products but many of these uh, vendors are just so stuck it's not a technical issue it's a it's a business issue that they need to disrupt their own business models uh, to really embrace this and that, that's where they're struggling uh, they're so used to literally selling a box and uh, and selling it through channels and the channels add uh, margins on top and it's a pretty simple sales uh, method when you open up to integration and, you, and your channels are now uh, contributing to that integration perhaps or uh, if you have elements of that integration that are open source and you have a community everything becomes a lot more um, service based in in the business model when it comes to the technology not not product based and and that's just I think I don't know I think they the, the short answer is they at least need to focus on what they're happy with uh, opening up and it should be their integration um, if they can go even further and start contributing to open source projects well, that, that's just better for the industry at, at whole. Like, imagine if we had some core components that are shared between vendors that are open source uh, and everyone can build their products on top of that, would have a building that would, everything would be talking literally the same language. So that would be the dream. I doubt it's going to get there anytime soon, but let's, uh, let's at least open the integration methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, so I think final question from me then is like maybe – you could just describe how it's benefited directly your business like you know being being open and obviously i know it's clear it's like kind of in your dna but i mean are there some sort of clear benefits where you you know you perhaps you've won business because of you know your your uh, yeah. Your, your ethos yeah yeah for sure so uh the, the fact that uh the clients are quite often much more technical than people in the industry so the end users uh, and we have had clients spin up their own dev environment, use our open source tools uh, without having to approach us whatsoever. And that in itself uh, validated the sale. So uh, we have definitely won projects because of, of that and having clear documentation and something they can uh, go through in their own time. Uh, particularly uh, technical clients such as universities, they, they love to get their hands dirty in that way. Uh, th then there's some like uh, there's, there's some obvious benefits too of, of having communities help you maintain your code. Uh, you know we're, we're a small business uh, essentially. There's, there's uh, about 20 developers in our team internally here, uh, but we have hundreds of contributors to some of our open source elements. So that that gives us this scalability that we don't have to pay for uh, in terms of resources. Uh, that's that's a clear benefit of of working on open source projects. And and then related to resources. Uh, we're attracting a lot of talented people because of this philosophy as well. People that uh, just expect it and they, they want to work in, in technology in the building industry. They want to work in technology that's, uh, I hate the phrase, for lack of a better word, IoT. But they come from a, a general technology background where they have already embraced open source. Uh, so we're one of the few companies in this in in this industry that they can approach, and and it allows us to attract good talent, such as the 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 shout out I did early on, uh, who I stole some of these slides from, Kim Burgess. I'm sure, if you spoke to him, one of the reasons he he uh, works for us is because we have open source uh, technology, and he's very uh, much on the same page in terms of his philosophy. So, I, I, look, I could sit here and list more benefits, but th that. That uh, that's one of the most interesting ones for me is the talent uh, and the resources. Yeah, um, it's a great point, isn't it? Especially now, it's such a competitive space for companies to tr attract the best uh, best quality developers. So yeah, good point. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, we've definitely got some questions coming. So um, rather than listen to me, let's take some of them now. Um, first one: As workspaces become more flexible, encourage working in creative spaces. How do you track the use of such spaces? Um, there are not traditional chairs and desks, i.e. breakout spaces and lounge areas. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, uh, well, there's no one method. I think this is the thing to, uh, to consider when um, you have a platform that connects to any number of things. We can just add more thing diagrams to that, that platform box. Uh, you can start stacking up the methods. So, uh, as I said, we always look for methods that exist. The, those traditional spaces are much easier, of course. Uh, even things like rooms with video conference systems, we can often use the cameras from Cisco to tell us uh, if people have turned up in the room and start counting people that way. Uh, the, the, then, the, but there's, there's 
a lot of existing technology we may be able to use if we look at different areas like the uh, the fire systems. Uh, a lot of the independently to everything else in smart buildings, uh, fire and uh, evacuation systems are becoming much more sophisticated, and they have uh, systems that are counting people on the floors for 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 reasons that are you know basically you can't have more than X amount of people on this floor. So they, they trigger alarms. We can use that input for a different thing, start counting people uh, in various zones. So I would say start with auditing what's there. Um, but another, uh, another sort of comment on, on uh, utilization data in general, um, I, I think it gets a lot of attention. Everyone wants to know what the utilization is, uh, but they don't drill deeper into what is the productivity outcome of these spaces? And, and our clients are actually much more interested in, in that question than is the space getting used or not? Because you can almost uh, objectively and, 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 and see if spaces are being used. The data is not as valuable as, as people think and our customers certainly want more than just that. So I would be looking at how do we measure what's happening in this space in other technology ways like uh, uh, for example, is the organisation ha having fewer traditional meetings because they're having more collaboration and, and breakout spaces? Are they producing more output since we introduced these spaces? And how do we measure that? And, and then, of course, the employee happiness part of it. Uh, is this giving purpose to the building when people could just work from home? Uh, and sometimes getting that data is, is a whole collection of things integrating into other systems, but also uh, surveying and working with human resources and uh, so it's not an easy answer, but um, my, my point here is don't just think about utilisation because it's not as valuable as a lot of people think it is in terms of uh, what the customers are thinking. When, it, when I say customers, I typically mean uh, large corporate workplaces. Right. Yeah. No, I, I can totally see that. Um, interesting that you mentioned sort of fire detection. What What is the... Um, it's not, you know, so it's not obviously the thing that gets integrated that much being, you know, kind of very highly regulated systems and stuff. Are you, are you yeah. now doing that more? It's, it's an interesting area. Like, I wouldn't say we're doing it much. Uh, I've only really just started investigating it for a particular client, but, um, but they do have APIs. They are on a secure network. It's, it's all just about, uh, it comes back to design. How do we get access to that, uh, that dependency and and not uh we're always avoiding like I, I often walk into meeting rooms and you see like three different sensors for three different systems one of them's lighting one of them's security one of them's uh, people counting and then you see three different touch panels and and then remotes like you always try to remove that double handling and uh it, it it's just an area i'm saying maybe watch this space because i think it's getting a lot, a lot more intelligent and uh, it's, it's being driven where there's lots of uh, strict building uh, uh, laws and, and that's very different region by region. Uh, I even see, see in Australia when we do something in New South Wales compared to Victoria, we have the, the building has a lot more fire technology built in that I'm looking to leverage. And, and that's a project I'm looking at at the moment uh, to leverage that. Yeah, definitely a good point about the... Uh about these sort of sensors and different systems as you see that and you can walk into any building and see that it's a bit wasteful uh more questions it's probably something already counting people that's almost guaranteed there's something counting people in every building mm. uh, any further thoughts on opportunities for more passive versus active interactions in a building experience interesting question uh, yes that's a, could, that, that's a very good question and uh, we could go in so many different directions so it's it's the language I use here is is autom automated workflows. So we're we're used to thinking about automation as as a physical event. If we've come from uh, you know building control land or uh, or audio visual land, uh, control is literally a relay switch that went on and off. So, but now we're looking at opportunities for workflow automation. Um, the any any way you have a a system of record. Uh, you should be leveraging that so you don't need multiple systems of record. And the, the easiest example uh, of that uh, is linking uh, meeting room scheduling to visitor management uh, and to some sort of experience in between, so concierge uh, integration. And, and the simple thing is if I add someone to my meeting room booking, uh, why do they have to check in if they're already within a system of record, uh, which in this case is Exchange or Google Calendar. So 
eliminating multiple systems of record is, is the first thing. And then these opportunities sort of just open up. So it's very different uh, for different organizations. Uh, uh, in, in Asia, for example, we, we do a lot of tie-ins to uh, the QR codes and, and, and chat programs that are used there. And, and trying to tie into interfaces that they're already using is, is, one, is one method here as well. So don't introduce a new interface. Uh, I, I wrote an article recently about uh, the, the downloads of apps being almost zero. Uh, no one wants to download a new app. So what interfaces do you tie into? And, and a lot of that comes into workflow. So within our system, um, ACA Engine, uh, we literally have an API and, and a, a, an admin interface that allows you to manage this uh, called triggers. So a trigger is a way to take any input from any system and trigger any action on any other system that's connected to the platform. So th there's so many different areas we can take this. It's just uh, it's just a design and it's, it's coming back to if you can think about that uh, and have the right dependency, you can make it happen. So I'm sure everyone has their own ideas around this more than I do. Uh, just the, the common one we see over and over again is tying room booking to visitor management. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah common thing. Um, obviously, it happens in every office throughout the world. Uh, comment here. Um, KNX is a is the EU um, a good example of open thinking? Yeah, definitely something that's used quite extensively in Europe. Uh, you've been using KNX at all? Yeah, for sure. So that's, uh, I think that's one good example of, of uh, the building industry coming together, the building vendors coming together somewhat. Uh, it's just, I wish it was, uh, I wish it was spread out a lot more than just that. And I, and I wish those other mm -hmm. other companies thought about their protocols in, in the same way. But it's, that's certainly open and, and that's a, a good starting point. Yeah, but I'd add back net to that list as well. Yeah. Um, right, another question here for you. Um, it was interesting that you mentioned that integration, integration should be point to point, not through middleware. Is there a risk of ex exponential increases in complexity when we add more and more integrations? Yeah, another good question. Yeah, I mean, the, the obvious answer there is is yes. And it's also, it comes down to the, the lack of awareness and of the architecture of these uh, third-party middleware. Uh, so a, a true platform can conform to the IT uh, requirements of a project. So it can be on-premise, on the client's cloud, on a public cloud, if, if that's the option, or any combination of that, including any combination of resilience, backup, and redundancy. But if the vendor is simply like, here's, here's the middle way you have to integrate with, you have no idea about uh, the, you know, the, the ports that are open on that system, the, the network infrastructure, the, the server architecture. Uh, in some cases, you don't, you don't even know what operating system it's running on, what, what cloud provider it's running on. Uh, and, and I, I actually see a lot uh, that companies get away with this because it's such a like black box that the it doesn't get it doesn't go through the security check because it's so closed off that security just completely missed that it's even there, uh, and they they put us through more security checks than this this one thing over there. Um, so it's it's uh, it the the scalability element is is extremely important. Uh, as projects just naturally get larger. Like uh, we're working with a client at the moment where we're doing uh, pretty much all of their offices uh, and we're starting with London, New York um, and a couple in, in, uh, in the Middle East and Europe and, uh, and Sydney and Singapore and Hong Kong, all as one deployment with the suitable redundancy. Uh, if everything we choose for that has to be cookie cutter and it's hard to stamp out anything that has that middleware. So it, it's, it, immediately loses the scalability. Yeah, um, yeah, excellent um, example there. Um, I mean, and then I guess sort of the middleware thing as well, like, I mean, you, in your ideal scenario, of course, that's, um, you, you wanted to connect these things directly, but I mean, we're dealing with quite a lot of complexity, I think, in buildings, aren't we? And we just got a lot of legacy stuff, a lot of um, different types of systems. And, you know, I guess the reality is that We'll need middleware at some point in most systems, but but I guess not always. And we should strive for, you know, the the best of what we can do, the best systems. Yeah, and if you think of uh, building access control, in my mind, is the next thing to to uh, remove the complexity of and make it more scalable. And 
that my, my comment based on having uh, a single record of um, uh, like a single record it doesn't make any sense that every organization uh, every tenancy within a building has their own completely secure uh, authentication solution such as ADFS that's running on Microsoft or, or something similar yeah and the building the building has just this crude system that is a card ID uh, and it's on a single server uh, and that is your access something that should be extremely secure so why are we having a second uh, system of record when the tenants already have a system of record and and that's where you can start removing the complexities mm -hmm. uh, it's just a matter of doing it it's just a matter of um, uh, convincing the right people that this is a better method uh, and and designing the solution uh, yeah. that, that's a complicated challenge because uh, it's it's the builders and, and the building operators that would have to make that decision yeah yeah no, I totally agree it's a great example um, it's certainly uh, something that can be um, innovated I think access right um, unfortunately we've come to the end um, Jonathan that was that was awesome and um, um, we could talk for another hour but unfortunately we have to we have to stop somewhere um, obviously we got on the screen there um, some of your resources the blog there john.sydney and um, and link to your company acaengine.com I'll put those links up on the the notes and obviously I'm going to make the uh, slides and the audio and the video available so anyone listening if you want to share that with with colleagues and uh, you'll be able to do that just um, go to our website later and they'll be online um, so yeah I just think it remains for me to say thanks to our sponsor Project Haystack go to haystackconnect.org if you're interested in going to their event uh, this May um, it'll be interesting you learn all about uh, what's going on with with the with their project uh, and also thanks to thanks to you Jonathan that was really interesting and um, I'm sure if anyone's wants to reach out to you or got questions they can go to ACA engine right yeah yeah more than happy uh, uh, either ACA engine or if you want my direct email address it's on my personal blog there too John Sydney great thanks again and thanks everyone for listening um, have a great day Yep. Thanks, everybody.